Hey there, folks, and welcome to another update on the geologic situation going on in Iceland's Reykjanes Peninsula. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Thanks for joining me. Today is Wednesday, April 23rd. Thanks for joining me and just wanted to go through the latest news, some of the data that's come in over the past week or so, and just catch you up to speed with what's going on in Iceland. So let's get right to it here. And let's start with the Met Office update that came through yesterday afternoon. Um, so the big takeaways here is we have continual inflation, although it's slowed a little bit. So the inflation signal from the GPS is slowing, um, but that seems to still indicate that we have magma moving into that shallow storage zone, magma still being fed to this zone from a deeper source. So we still have magma moving into the system, which would seem to indicate that at some point in the future, we're going to deal with another intrusion and or another eruption. Uh, we also have had really calm weather across the Reykjanes over the past few days. And so the ability of the seismometers to be able to pick up not just uh, more earthquakes, but smaller earthquakes has been greater. And so we have a good signal coming in from the earthquakes. Um, and so, and they have a new hazard map as well that's good for the next week or two. So let's go ahead and just check out this brief um, uh, update from the Met Office. Uh, you can see here uplift continues, but the rate significantly decreased. And now we're seeing something similar to we saw before that April 1st event. Um, they have a map that I'll show you a similar one here in a little bit, uh, showing the distribution of earthquakes across the Reykjanes Peninsula over the past week or so. You can see in general, those earthquakes are delineating this magmatic dike, this intrusion feature that formed uh, previous to April 1st, but was re-injected with magma on April 1st. Um, like I mentioned, micro earthquake activity, um, continues in this area. It's very small earthquakes happening, but enough that we can detect them. Uh, most of the earthquakes have been under one, and the biggest one was a 1.7. Looking at the new hazard map they have here, and let's get this thing kind of full screen. Remember, the uh, Met Office now has a new hazard um, way of assessing hazards and a new way of producing their hazard map. So instead of these kind of uh, odd geometric uh, trapezoidal shapes now it's a little bit more detailed and they're able to delineate specific areas of concern so it's more down to this 20 meter by 20 meter uh, pixelated zones you can see the yellow area shown here is an area of moderate hazards so they assess the the hazard level on a scale from very low to very high then they go through for each one of these areas here um, what the what the um, Ha what the specific hazards are. So looking specifically at these six um, urban areas or settled areas, A, B, C, D, E, and F, uh, what the specific hazards are for each one of these zones. So you can see down here in Grindavik, which is still in the moderate hazard category, because it's very close to, if not top of, on top of that magmatic dike or that intrusion feature in the subsurface. We have seismic activity, so you know earthquakes, sinkholes, we can get uh, collapses and cracks opening up when there's uh, some seismic activity. Possibility for fissures and vents opening up, which are associated with lava flows. Potential for tephra, so material in an eruption that is airborne. Maybe that's from interaction with water or more explosive phase. Um, tephra fallout and then gas pollution. So those are the hazards. Looking at, at zone one, zone B around the power plant Blue Lagoon, um, a little bit lower hazard because we don't, we're not expecting some of the vents to open up there, although it's close enough that lava flows um, could reach it and some other activity, earthquakes and such there. So you can read uh, the hazards for each one of those. And right now we're sort of at, you know on a, on a zero to three scale of volcano alert levels from three being an eruption is happening or expected any moment to, you know, kind of background levels. We're sort of in this, this heightened, or not heightened, I guess they have that for level two, but this volcanic unrest phase here where um, we have, magmatic processes and things happening in the subsurface. Um, things aren't quiet as usual and they can either escalate or de-escalate. So that's a little bit different map. You can see that there's got some of the, the fissures and cracks and structural features that run across the landscape delineated here. Those are zones that could be reactivated um, 
with fault movement. And so they uh, have those listed as moderate, even though they're surrounded by uh, areas of low hazard risk. Looking at the earthquakes over the past 24 hours, not a whole lot to see here. I think the weak uh, distribution of earthquakes will be a little bit more telling, but you can see very small earthquakes. Uh, if we if we pull in everything, um, you get more. So this is even getting the negative magnitude quakes, um, mostly defining this zone going from just west of Gorindavik up through the Sunukur crater and then off to the northeast. So that delineates the dike quite nicely. And then a little cluster of these very small quakes over at Fagradalsfjall. Again, I don't think right now there's no evidence to suggest there's anything going on there. Uh, this area is very close to the, the action in terms of the stress generated by the dike and some of the other things going on there. Uh, so this, you know, we'll have to see what happens here. But for now, I'm not too concerned. If we bring in everything over magnitude zero, you can see a lot of those quakes go away. And then if we try to include everything over magnitude one, uh, we lose all but about three or so earthquakes across the Reykjanes. So not a lot of seismic activity happening in sort of in terms of larger magnitude events, but at the very small micro earthquake range, uh, we do have some data there that suggests what might be happening. When we look at earthquakes over the past week, I think this is um, a little bit more telling and very nicely defines uh, that structural uh, intrusion there. You can see the, the bit of a change of direction here. There's a bit of an elbow right about here where it changes orientation, turns a little bit more easterly here. Um, and then that's that northern tip is where it extended. And so we, we're seeing a little bit more earthquake activity at this end. And then we saw on April 1st, it also extend a little bit further to the southwest. And looks like that maybe is the biggest quake there. Uh, that's a 1.8. Everything else is much smaller. Uh, this one was about a week ago, 1.5. You can see those small earthquakes there. And then, yeah, just this little cluster of very tiny earthquakes around Fagradelsfjall. Um, these look like they're pretty evenly distributed over time. I'm seeing quite a few blue, green, yellow, orange, and red dots. So these are kind of going on throughout this week period. Uh, and again, very small earthquakes. Maybe the biggest one's that one there, which was a magnitude one. Everything else is small. Um, looks like depths ranging from, yeah, around seven kilometers or so. Um, so too early to suggest that there's anything going on there in terms of magma movement towards the surface. And as we look at the GPS data, there's certainly nothing yet to suggest that um, magma is def causing any ground deformation in that area. So there's our earthquake data across the Reykjanes for the past week or so. Um, a few over here at Krishavik as well, but the, the lion's share of those earthquakes uh, right along that intrus intrusive dike that formed on April 1st. Uh, if we go look at the GPS data, um, and we could start with, I suppose, uh, the Svartsengi station, but we can look at some others as well. Um, make sure my mug is out of the way. There we go. So here's our um, east-west, or excuse me, north-south plot here. So you can see um, slight, very slight northward movement that jumped further to the north on April 1st. That was our last big event. East-west plot, the middle one with the green dots here showing more or less no east-west movement for the most part. And then uh, a pronounced downward movement, which means it's to the west on April 1st. And then here's our up and down motion. So you can see this, you know, kind of ebbing and flowing a little bit, but overall there's a, a very low angle inflationary trend to this data arriving here on April 1st when the magma moved out from beneath the power plant and the Blue Lagoon and, it, and moved into and created that dike to the east. And so that meant that this location at the power plant showed a downward signal, a deflationary signal. And since then, um, you can see it's been rising and initially it was rising quite steeply. We have a fairly steep slope here uh, coming out of the gates in the few days after April 1st. But since then, you can see it's taken on a much less steep um, angle here in terms of the inflation rate uh, as measured by this GPS station. And so we're pretty close to, the, this is the zero mark over here. If you kind of take this ac across the whole, uh, graph. So we're about to this level here, and it appears that last time we needed to get to about a little north of 120 millimeters of uplift um, in order for 
the eruption to occur. And again, this is just one station, one data point, but it does give us a little bit of something to work with in terms of if you extrapolate the angle here, this is sort of a, a curve, obviously, but if you extrap extrapolate the, the end, the slope here of this line, um, and take into account where we are here. It is likely that as this, as we move forward into May and maybe even June, that this, the rest of this data will start to look a little bit like this one with maybe some undulations here and there, but overall a very uh, low angle or gentle slope moving upwards. And what that means then is if you could sort of consider that where we are now is sort of, not exactly, um, the beginning point here probably should be a little bit lower than that. What that might mean is that we have a good, you know, here's all of February, here's all of March. We might have a good two, two and a half more months before we reach any sort of critical threshold for the next event to occur. Again, that's very speculative. It's just one sort of, um, uh, you know, extrapolation looking at the data and not even quantitative at that, but just one way to kind of look at it. So as people sort of, you know, wait and see what might happen here, it could be, you know, several months. We could be well into uh, the end of June, maybe even into July before we see this next event transpire. Now, that being said, of course, we have a completely different plumbing system than we had before. We have, um, you know, th this dike changed the equation um, markedly from what we had going on previously. Previously, we had lots of eruptive events um, sort of in this zone right here. Here's the, uh, let's see, the March, November, August, May, December, February. All these events taking place basically between Selingerfeld and Storastogfeld, this little zone in here. This was the main area where the eruptions were taking place. But now we have to uh, consider that... Uh, that vent and that conduit may not exist anymore. We know we had this most recent event occur much further to the south um, and right through the defensive berms that are built up here, right by the greenhouse there. And so what we may see moving forward is uh, something very different. So it's hard to predict or speculate right now where the next event is going to erupt but maybe not in this area here. We have different plumbing system, different conduits. Um, we had, you know, pretty good seismicity down here near Grindavik and most importantly out here on the Northeast trend. So it's now just a matter of like how those, those conduits and interconnections have changed and where will the magma go next? Will it find more space in the subsurface to force itself into and inject and maybe lengthen this dike or create a second dike uh, or will it find an easier path up to the surface and these are all just big questions so um yeah so it's possible that it takes two more months um, that's just one possible scenario again using a very sort of simplistic view of this data here um elsewhere for gps measurements um you know, we had those earthquakes I talked about around uh, Fagradalsfjat here and uh, over the past week. But when we look at the, let's use this here. When we look at the GPS in that area, this one's actually maybe the closest one. Um, we really don't see any significant movement in the data. So here's the up-down movement. Um, changes it on April 1st, as you might expect. But then, since then, maybe there's a slight upward trend, but just again, big error bars there, probably more likely flatlined versus anything. Uh, there has been a bit of a movement to the south and to the east here uh, since April 1st, and the the east-west plot shows it moving more, more steadily to the east. That might be expected when you've got you know this intrusion of magma that it's pushing that GPS zone um, to the east and maybe as that continues to inflate and store more magma we might see it moving to the east even more so um, so couple things there um, none of the other GPS trends really stuck out to me the one station that's closest to that northeast end of the dike uh, Vogar near the town uh, is pretty much flatlined now. I think if you just take the aggregate of all those points and the error bars and just fit a line in there, it's pretty horizontal or pretty close to horizontal. So I think moving forward, we'll continue to watch the, uh, the GPS data uh, and see if some of these trends change uh, in terms of the inflation around the power plant. 
and Svartsangi, such as the one we have here. So will these um, continue to level off? Will they continue up at this kind of uh, lower, um, you know, this less steep slope? Um, that will be something to watch for uh, along with the earthquakes. But for now, again, it's just a, a bit of a wait and see game and um, just kind of watching the data as things occur. Um, undoubtedly, there's lots of great research happening and discoveries being made with the, the last, I guess, a year and a half or so happening here on the Reiki Nest. But I'll continue to update you as best I can as new uh, information arrives. Thanks for your support of the channel. Thanks for being part of our team here today and hope you enjoyed this. We'll see you next time. Take care.